Never held a microphone before. Um, I am so excited to be here, and I'm super honored to have y'all here to look around and see familiar faces and some faces that I don't know. Um, I know your time is valuable, and so yeah, it means a lot that you'd spend your morning here. And I'm so appreciative, Alicia, for asking me to do this and for Creative Mornings for being here. I'm so thrilled that um, they brought this in. I didn't know about it, and now I'm kind of obsessed. I watched a ton of videos, and it's super inspiring. So to be a part of it feels super humbling, and I'm really appreciative. Um, I've never done anything like this before, so I'm like sweating and I'm nervous. <laughs> uh, my friends are so good to me. They know how much I love. I, mean, I know I look like I would just listen to like folk music, but I love dirty rap. And so <laughs> my friend Shoni definitely brought a speaker and we just danced out in the front to get excited, listen to a little Kanye, it's good. <laughs> so um, I am gonna start with just kind of telling my story and um, I'm going to just kind of share about how I got to this place today, and hopefully um, I will not cry too much. I brought, this was actually my dad's handkerchief. Um, oh, that already made me tear up. Uh, he always had a handkerchief with him, and he um, would give it to me when I was crying or if I had a cold or anything, so that feels good to have that here. Um, I am also not great at multi-talent multitasking, so holding a microphone, pressing a button. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try to do all these things. Oh, that's me, as a baby. And that's my older brother, Lyle. He, I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, two older brothers. Um, my dad, that's where I get my limbs from. He was long, like me. Uh, I grew up on a farm. He plowed our garden with a mule. Look how cute he is. Um, and that's me and my two older brothers. Uh, we were pretty tight. I slept in my oldest brother's room till I graduated high school. He, no, he graduated high school, and I slept in his room till he graduated high school. Uh, never slept in my own room till then. Um, had a really great childhood. I was really fortunate, and I was a good kid. Didn't have a whole lot of hard things happen. And then when I was a senior in high school, um, there was a bunch of cars and we were going to Celebration Station in Baton Rouge and I actually pulled out in front of an ambulance and he hit me on my car door going 65. And so um, my car door ended up in the passenger seat and I broke three ribs, they punctured my lungs, my lungs collapsed and my spleen ruptured and I broke the top two vertebrae in my neck, C1 and C2. And I had about a 5% five five chance to live and about a 1% chance to walk. And what they know is if it had not been an ambulance driver, I wouldn't have made it. Um, so that's kind of miraculous in and of itself. He had everything there to save my life. I was on life support, the whole shebang. It actually happened on my dad's birthday, November 2nd. And um, I, so this is a photo the week after my, I have two photos from that time, this is one my sweet little cheerleading squad did this bus through. Um, and I vaguely remember they came to the hospital, this was the Friday after my accident, but I, my lung had collapsed again, so I would like gone back into surgery and I was like totally doped up. But I got to see this on the news and I have like a like, slight memory of getting to watch this and it meant so much to me. But um, after I was like off life support they, uh, and stable, they took bone out of my hip and fused it into my neck and they used wire back then for spinal cord fusions, and that ends up being a big part of the story. And uh, I was fortunate. I had youth 
I had um, good health on my side. I, I healed rather quickly. I was able to go back to school after Christmas. This is the only other photo I have from this time. And I was, <laughs> I was so embarrassed. Our, our homecoming was rained out, and so they put us in the Christmas parade. And this was literally a week after I got out of the hospital. And they had, like, I had lost all this weight, and they'd, like, shaved the under part of my hair. And this was, like, the first time I was in public. And I was just mortified. I was so embarrassed. But it was also sweet, because it was, like, the first time I was seeing this community that had come alongside us and loved us so well through this whole crazy, crazy experience. Um, so I kind of went back to life as normal. I was really fortunate, like all of my scars are from surgery, and so you couldn't see much that it happened. I mean, for five months I had a neck brace, but after that, like, I, I kind of blocked it out in some ways. Like when I would tell the story, I almost talked about it like in third person, like it almost didn't feel like it had happened to me. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of residual effects from it. I lived pretty carefree. I didn't feel a lot of pain. If I danced too much, I'd get sore, but that's really it. Um, I went to college, had great experiences. I was a terrible student, but I loved the social aspect of it. Had a lot of fun, uh, met a lot of amazing people. Um, my best friend Katie lived with her in college. I don't see her right this second, but she's right there. Um, yeah, I met beautiful people, had really beautiful experiences, ended up moving to Nashville um, to do youth ministry. And I guess about a year and a half after I got here, I ended up meeting my very first boyfriend. Um, up to that point, my mom was a little nervous that I didn't like boys. Um, and he was super kind and sweet and talented and uh, just amazing musician, and we got married like 10 months later and uh, started our lives together. We lived, um, moved to East Nashville and started a life there, and probably about a year after we got married, I started having just crazy intense pain, um, debilitating pain, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, started this really long, long, long process of trying to figure out what was the source of this pain. Like, I would get this shooting pain up my neck, and I'd feel like I was just going to pass out or throw up. And then I'd feel, like, migraines, and it was, it was really debilitating. And we started this long process of meeting with all these doctors, and every time they would have me get films, and every time the films would come back, there'd be this little black spot over my neck where the wires from the fusion were, and they'd be like, oh, that's just the wire interacting with the magnet in the machine. Everything around it looks fine. We try a ton of different therapies, and um, we'd always kind of come back to, like, you're kind of going to just have pain. And they also then started me on pretty heavy narcotics. Um, I just didn't want to hurt, you know? So I took whatever they said to take. And... Um, it just started this long process of feeling like a little hope, like we'd try something new and it wouldn't help, and I would just feel really hopeless and a lot of despair. And the more medicine I took, um, I'd feel more hopeless. And it just, it was just a pretty vicious, hard cycle. And this went on for at least four years. Till um, finally, um, my mother in law actually set up an appointment for me to see a doctor in Dallas. And I brought him my films, and he was like, I, I can't tell you what's going on until I see what's under that black spot. And so um, he arranged for me to get um, basically a $50 x-ray is what showed what was going on. And this is a photo. One of um, the wires from my spinal cord fusion had broken and pierced into my brainstem. And... Um, and I'm the only one in the world um, that's ever had this. And the doctor called and left this frantic sounding message on my voicemail, like, you've got to get back here right now. Um, what we learned was I should be paralyzed. They knew if we didn't remove the wire, I would be paralyzed eventually. But the surgery itself was very high risk. 
of paralysis. Here's another photo of it. So it was supposed to be wrapped down and somehow it had broken and pierced. And so it was already a freak thing that I had broken that high up, but then on top of it to have like this wire. So I shouldn't, I should not be walking right now, you know? So um, it was this crazy, I just found out this crazy amount of information, scared out of my freaking mind. Um, I definitely have some like PTSD surrounding doctors and hospitals and you know all that that entails I was just I couldn't even like deal with it I was so freaked out and so um, I kind of buried my head couldn't even really think about it my brothers kind of took over were like talking to doctors for me and a few weeks later my dad my papa had gone to visit our Amish friends and he had told my um, godfather and my mom that he was gonna come see me after um, this surgery, excuse me, after he saw them on his way home to tell me that he would sell our farm if he needed to, to make sure I could have this surgery. And um, the night before he was leaving, so he loved the Amish, they're like his favorite people in the world. Um, and he, my house was on the way home. He was like picking up a mule or a donkey or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, and that night, he ended up falling down a flight of stairs and ended up uh, passing a brain damage. So it was like, it was just this like crazy time. I didn't know how to even think straight. My friend Katie spent the whole night in the hospital with me. They brought him to Vanderbilt because this was the closest hospital and we knew he wasn't gonna make it, but we kept him on life support until my family could get here. Um, it, was, it was crazy and it was really hard. And this beautiful thing that came out of that was my godfather ended up setting up a medical fund for me so I could have this surgery in my dad's honor and people just came out of the woodworks. Like, my dad, um, he was a principal and then a superintendent of schools, and he had just loved people so well. And uh, people would write these letters like, your dad bought my prom dress, and your dad paid my tuition, your dad sent me to college, your dad fixed my roof, your dad sent me on my senior trip. Like, people just from all over the world raised this insane amount of money for me to have the surgery because he had loved people so well. And he still, you know, he wanted to, he'd offered to sell our farm, but like he still took care of me. Like there's just this beautiful thing that came out of his love for people, made it possible for me to have the surgery. And then also some friends in town ended up throwing a benefit. I was so nervous. Uh, that was me on the news. Uh, but at this benefit, my friends did, and it was so humbling, and all of our friends came together, and they played music, and had a silent auction, and people donated their time, and their energy, and their money, and it was one of the most humbling things I've ever experienced. I was blown away. Um, so this beautiful thing that happened in that time was I was in this state of just panic and I needed to find a way to not focus on all the brokenness that was going on around me. And so I started decorating my house. Um, I did not know I was any good at that whatsoever. Up to that point, when people would ask me if I was like a creative, I'd be like, no, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I think because I dress a little quirky maybe, they, people might have thought I was artistic. I'm like, no, 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 no not a creative bone, I do not know how to do anything. And I never really knew also like what I was good at. I was terrible in school, but I'd never taken an art class. Like I didn't grow up in a creative home and I'd always loved beauty and creativity. I just didn't know that I could create it. So it was this time, like I, I think I just needed to focus on something beautiful and I needed my home to feel really good because I knew that I was gonna have to be in it for a really long time, recovering from this crazy surgery that I was gonna have, but if the surgery didn't go well, I'd have to be in there any, even longer. So room by room, I started decorating my house, and um, I had this friend in town that would always stay with us, named Reed Rolls, and he ended up shooting it. 
And it ended up on Design Sponge. This was the article. And what was so beautiful is people, um, it was other people's words telling me that I was good at it. I had no idea. And um, people thought that's what I did. They thought I did decorating. And I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. No. Like, no. I can't. I don't know how to help you. Like, I don't, I don't even know what this is. You know, I just... It was just for me, it was just me looking for like the hidden beauty in my surroundings. I just needed to focus on something other than the trauma that was happening, you know? So that was the first time I, I really saw this like beauty and redemption come out of something really broken. So I discovered that I'm a creative and I had no idea. Um, so that's really beautiful. So um, we ended up, I met with a ton of doctors the one really beautiful thing about having a freak medical accident, medical condition, is doctors are like chomping at the bit to work on you. So Mayo actually reached out to me and it was scary. It was really hard because it's not like I could go off a doctor with experience because no one had ever done anything like this and every doctor had a different idea of what they should do and everyone was just kind of guessing. And I just kind of had to go off my intuition and my gut. and. So I chose Mayo, this um, top neurologist and top orthopedic surgeon, ended up doing the surgery together. And it was a full day. And, um, you know, I, I thought I knew pain. And I had no idea. Um, I'd never hurt so badly as um, I did at that time in that surgery. And I just remember, like, I just wanted my dad, you know? I just wanted him to be there. He just always made me feel like everything was gonna be okay. And I just missed him, something like fierce. And we had this incredible support system. Um, the doctors ended up removing the wire and they took bone from my other hip. And this time they used a bunch of titanium screws, no wire, um, to fuse my neck back together. And they, the doctors had hoped, they couldn't promise me, but they had hoped that with removing the wire that maybe I wouldn't have as much pain. Um, but like the focus was me to be walking in years. You know, that's, that's why we were removing it. Um, it was, I, I left there walking, you know, I, I'm walking and I am eternally grateful for that. Um, the whole, I'm kind of just skimming over that time because there's a lot that went into it, but basically I left walking. My pain, um, it's weird. It kind of changed after that. Um, I, uh, before it was more like muscle and I'd have this like shooting pain. And then I think after they removed the wire and did use the titanium screws, I got a lot of nerve damage. And so my right side just feels like it's on fire all the time. And the best way I know how to describe it is like one time I was setting, my right foot was standing in red ants and I didn't know it. And my brother like yelled at me and I looked down and I had just tons and tons of red ant bites up my right leg. And it just, it felt like more of the same. So I didn't, I didn't know, you know. Um, so yeah, so I got home. Um, I was on a crazy amount of medication I didn't know how to handle chronic pain at all. Um, I was pretty shut down and pretty depressed and feeling pretty isolated. And I didn't want to be a burden to my friends and family. It was really, really hard on my marriage. Um, and, uh, well, I skipped this part. Taylor Swift. Um, so one other crazy thing, she ended up shooting um, her red album art at my house. And uh, people, again, like thought that's what I did. And I'm like, no, I don't know what I'm doing at all. But it was this like beautiful thing that happened and these crazy opportunities that came out of that. But actually, I was crazy sick when they did this um, shoot. So around this time, actually, I had had another surgery for um, infertility reasons. And while I was in the hospital, I caught this crazy bacterial infection called C. diff. 
It's the worst. Um, I thought I was going to die. It was awful. And I was literally barely functional. I was spending all of my time in bed. Um, my pain was through the roof. Um, I literally let like three or four friends into my life. My friend Katie, my friend Catherine, my friend Debbie, and my friend Leslie. Like everyone else. I didn't, I couldn't even, I couldn't see straight. I could barely function. And I felt so hopeless and so much despair. And I was just like, why am I still here? I am not living any sort of life whatsoever. And, um, and my husband was on tour, and I had this just really strong feeling that, like, my marriage was coming to an end. And I just hit this wall. I mean, major wall, like, breakdown. And I ended up having to move home. And I was home almost two months. And I just remember feeling so much shame and so much embarrassment and just feeling like, why are you still here? Like, you are just wasting wasting your life like you're spending all your time in bed you can't even function you can't even see straight like I literally I, I went 20 something days without sleeping um I was a disaster and um I also like I felt like a disappointment you know like I felt like I was disappointing my family and disappointing my friends and I just felt the weight of the world and I was on this just insane amount of medication, which was just numbing me so much and making me so apathetic and, like, not motivated at all. I just couldn't, I had no hope. And one of the, like, most beautiful things that came out of that, hitting that crazy wall, was I just was like, whatever I'm doing is not working. This is not working. I am not living any sort of life at all. And so I decided, like, I'm like, I still hurt every second of every day, so why, this medicine isn't helping me at all. I'm a slave to it. So I decided to start weaning myself off of that medication. And I also um, decided in that, part, in that part of my life, I'm like, so you can either lay here in bed and hurt all the time, or you can actually get your ass up and go do life and hurt. So, like what's the better option, like lay here and hurt or like go be with people, you know? And so it just, I decided to just like start changing my thought process. Like I just, I was like, okay, this isn't working. So we got to do something different. So I started the four month process of weaning myself off this insane, like I was on um, this fentanyl patch that they give like dying cancer patients. I was on morphine. I was on sleep medicine. I mean, depression medicine, and I was like, I want out. So I probably way too quickly decided on my own to start weaning myself off of everything because I was just like, I want it out. I want it, I want it done. And with my incredible family's help and my friend's support, um, I started that process. And I had this really beautiful vision. Um, after a few months, I, I came back home, um, and I started feeling, my mind started feeling like me again. Like, I still had all of my pain. The pain didn't go away. Um, but my mind started seeing things clearly. I started looking for beauty all around me. And I felt like I did when I was in second grade. And I got glasses for the first time. And I walked out of the doctor's office. And I was like, oh, Mom, look at the sky. Like, oh, my God. Like, look at the birds. Like, it, I was so, I was in awe and I was amazed. And that's, that's what I started feeling again. Like, I started being able to see beauty around me in people and I started looking for it, you know? And before that was just, it was suppressed. It was like numbed. And um, I also heard the, this quote for the first time the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. And I was like, that's it. Like, that sums up my life. Like, I can feel joy on such a deep level because I've experienced pain and loss on such a deep level, but I have to, like, choose to go find that joy and to look for that joy. So, um, December 2008, 
2013 was one year since I had weaned myself off of everything. Um, and that felt really good, you know? So I moved back home. Uh, my husband and I, we'd actually, we bought a larger house we wanted to adopt. And um, things were just really turning around. Like I just felt, I felt like myself again, but obviously a, an altered version. Like I still had my pain, but my mind felt like me. And um, so then February, I have not looked at my notes. I don't know. Sorry if I missed a few things. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, so February of last year, 2013, um, I... My world kind of turned upside down again. I, I found myself single for the first time in um, over a decade. And I was scared out of my gourd. And I was um, heartbroken and sad. And I didn't know what to do. And I just, I decided in that time, I was like, okay. You've learned the hard way on what not to do when going through brokenness and pain and suffering. You've learned what doesn't work. So now you're going to have to do the opposite. Because everything you've done in the past, when you shut down and you isolated and you checked out, there was nothing life-giving about that. It only brought more pain. It only made your pain worse. Like So this time, and there's so much grace in learning those lessons the hard way because now I know different. And so I know what to do. So I was like, okay, you got to get your ass up and take a shower and you got to go do life. And so for me, that was, first off, I'm like, it's so easy to want to, um, it's easy to want to feel bitterness and just lead with your pain. You know, for the longest time, I led with my pain and with my loss. And so that's how people saw me. So nine times out of ten, when I'd see people, they'd be like, how are you feeling? And because that's what I led with. And then I just, I stopped. Like, my pain and my brokenness and all those things, they're a part of me. They're a part of my story. But they don't define me anymore. So now, when people leave me, like, I want people to leave feeling cared for and feeling seen and feeling loved not like poor Ruthie you know so at that time I was like you just got to go be with people you just got to go go through the motions like I wasn't feeling like I was going to be this great friend you know I'm like do it anyway like go through the motions go seek out people go serve people go find the beauty in other people and tell them the beauty that you see in them tell them that's another really big thing. Um, look for it in the people around you and speak it. Um, so I, I was trying to do that, you know? And also this other really amazing thing that happened in the, that time was like, I was like, okay, you have to figure out how to pay your bills. Um, and so I was like, go through the motions. Like, I don't feel like, I didn't feel like I was like this talented decorator, but people told me that that's what I was good at. So it's like, I'm just going to trust that and I'm just going to go do it. I'm going to like go offer my services to people and try to make spaces and experiences as beautiful as I can possibly make them. Just at first, it was a lot of just going through the motions and just making myself do it. And then what was so beautiful is like the emotions came and I just also decided to like not let my fear hold me back. I let the fear of my body, how my body would handle situations, hold me back for a really long time. And I was like, you don't have that option anymore. You don't have that luxury. So get off your ass and just go do it. And so I was like just offering my services. And I just started meeting with people. And I started a blog. And I started... Um, seeking beauty in whatever way I could. Like, I love sunsets. So I'm like, go see as many sunsets as possible. I love to dance. Like, I had not danced in 
years. In college, everyone knew me as the tall girl that was always dancing to booty music. And I had not danced in so long. And I'm like, who cares if you're more sore the next day? It is something that is so fun and so life-giving to me. So I started dancing again. I was like, be foolish, be silly, be childlike, whatever these things that like brought life. I just tried to seek them as much as possible, like fighting, finding that like hidden beauty in everything around me that I could. I was just trying to cling to it. And this is, I don't know, I struggle. I don't want to ever seem like it's this like Pollyanna-ish, like everything's awesome because it's it's both. It's broken and it's painful and it's so important to mourn and to feel the pain of what's going on and to let your friends come alongside of you and walk with you and to, when I'm having a really shatty day, like to reach out to my community and let them walk with me. But it's also like important to not stay there, you know? And so I was trying to find that balance of doing both, of seeking beauty as much as I could possibly do it. I started picking wildflowers as much as possible and giving flowers away as much as possible. And it was funny because I started um, this Instagram account and I would just post the things that I was doing. And what was beautiful is people kind of started thinking that's what I was already doing as a job and asking to hire me. So I was like, I have no game face, zero, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and so when people would ask me, I'm like, well, I've never done that before. I don't know what I'm doing, but yes, I would love to do that for you, you know? And so I also just kind of decided to say yes, even though I was scared out of my gourd. And I still am. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just, I'm just saying yes as much as I can, you know? And so I was like posting things like this is a dinner party. I love bringing people together and creating a sense of community. And um, people started hiring me to host dinners and to do table. I, I hate cooking, but I love setting tables. So I'm like, I didn't know I was good at that. Well, this is awesome. People want to pay me to set a table? Like, yes, I'd love to do that. And um, there's some flowers that I got to do for like a kinfolk workshop. And one opportunity would just lead to another opportunity to another opportunity. And it's been like the most humbling thing ever because I... I have to look back on this year and I'm like, you know, I wouldn't have chosen this to be the situation that I'm in. This isn't, no one chooses divorce or pain. Nobody wish, wishes that to be a part of their lives. But that's, what, that's, that's what's happened. That's, that's what's going on in my life. And so what are you going to do with that, you know? So um, I was doing all these things. Well, early fall... Um, I started feeling this like weird conviction because people that didn't know me now were like following me on Instagram and I'd get these crazy comments like, you live my dream life, like I want your life. And I just would feel like sick to my stomach because I was just like, man, like I might know how to post a pretty picture or style a pretty picture, but you don't know the context of what is going on here. And I felt this like inauthentic thing because I'm like, there's a context of, of my joy, you know? And there's also a lot of brokenness going on here. And I had remembered, I had this vision of me like laying in my bed, looking at like Facebook and feeling a lot of depression because I was like, I wish I was doing that. I wish I wasn't laying here hurting all the time and I was out like playing with my children or, you know, doing these things. And so I ended up um, writing out my story in the early fall and trying to be as vulnerable and authentic as possible and just sharing my failures and my brokenness. And it's so interesting. Like, we think those things that would, like, repel people um, about ourselves, our shame, it's so opposite. Like, the second I shared all of my failures and brokenness and mistakes, um, it drew people in. I think people long for authenticity. People long for connection. And everyone has brokenness. So when we're honest and when we're vulnerable, there's something so beautiful and so redemptive. And I remember a counselor once telling me, like, when we speak out loud those things that we feel the most shame about, it takes the power away from it just a little bit each time. And I just thought, 
That's so beautiful. And there's something so freeing about being real and about being honest and about being open. There's something so beautiful about it. And so I, I did, and it was just this amazing thing. Like I started um, having people that I've never met write me and tell me their stories of brokenness. And it's been like, it's the most humbling thing in the whole world. Like it's such an honor to me because, you know, I think another really beautiful hidden thing that comes out of brokenness is it gives you empathy in ways that you never had empathy before. Like I can walk with someone who's lost a parent in a way that I could never have walked with someone before. I can walk with someone that's struggling with pain emotionally, physically, or spiritually in a really deep way, in a way that I could not have ever done before. And there's something so beautiful about that. Like our, our brokenness and our gifts, like we can use those to bless other people. And that's what I really long to do. I, I got to go to a Donald Miller story conference in the fall and it was, I wept for two days straight because it felt like everything came so clear. I remember him talking about how we can either let things make us bitter, like the brokenness in our lives make us bitter, or we can let it make us better. And I was like, yes, yes, like I want it to make me better, you know? And then he also, the thing that I pulled that was like the most beautiful to me is he talked about like give purpose to your pain. And every day when I receive these notes from people or someone might feel encouraged um, because of my story, I'm like, that's what makes me want to get off my heating pad in the morning. That's what makes my pain feel purposeful, like that it can maybe be a blessing to someone else makes it feel purposeful to me. And I feel like what I walked away from that conference with was like, man, I want to share the story. And why I wrote out my story in the first place, like with these girls saying, like, you live my dream life, I wanted to say to them, like, my circumstances haven't changed. This stuff is hard, but like you too, in the midst of your brokenness and your pain, can live a really beautiful life. Like we don't have to let those things hold us down. Like you too can go chase a sunset. Like you can go make a picnic with your friends. Like you can go roll down a hill and dance like a fool and be silly. Like these are all things that everyone can do and your circumstances don't have to rule that, you know? So I know I've gone a really long time. Um, there, that's me chasing the sunset. Um, this, I am going to look up how to say this word because my southern little draw would probably ruin it. Um, it, the word is kintsu kuroi. I, um, I met with this precious girl who's doing um, some intern work with me. And she told me about this word, and it's this ancient Japanese practice of taking a piece of pottery that's been broken, broken and putting it back together with gold. And the definition here says, to repair with gold through an art of repairing pottery with gold or silver lacquer and understanding that the piece is more beautiful for having been broken. And I heard that, and I saw that, and I just, like, wept. Because I was like, man... That is the most beautiful analogy I've ever heard. Like, my story, the loss, the pain, the brokenness, like, it's been really hard. But it's made me into a more beautiful version of myself. You know, a deeper version, a more empathetic version. Um, and I believe that to be true for everyone. Like, everyone has that. Like, we all have brokenness, and we all have pain like life is hard you know there's there's a lot of loss and there's a lot of suffering but like to look and to see the redemption and the hidden beauty that's just all over it is to change the view that we see life and to seek beauty as much as possible um it changes everything and it's a gift um so now like you know when when i get these messages like I can look back on everything and I'm like man I wouldn't change one thing of course like I wish my dad was here I wish I didn't have pain every day but 
it's made me a more whole, more beautiful person. And I'm so thankful for that. And I wouldn't change it. So that's it. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being here.